guys have heard me speak before? How many of you guys have heard me speak before? All right, well, that's most of you, so I'm good. Thank you guys very much. Have a great day. I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of my story. I understand that this unit is a very, very, very strong faith unit. Am I right about that, or have I heard stories that aren't true? So what that's going to do for me is that's going to shift a little bit of my story from it being something that's really going after casting the net to grab people and pull you in to really trying to build you up and edify you as men. Let me tell you the reason why. I strongly believe that God is raising up the greatest leaders out of prisons like Eastham right now. But the thing that makes you strong isn't your ability to tell other people how they should live their life. The thing that makes us strong men is our ability to let other people see how God is changing our lives. Don't make your mouth your Bible. Make your life something attractive that other men will look to and they'll say, that is a man that I would follow. When I travel and speak in prisons all over the country, let me tell you who I look for. I look for the biggest, the meanest, the maddest, bad dog on the camp. I want him. The reason I want him is because I'm not going to be able to stay here after I finish speaking, but he'll still be here. And if I can get the meanest, baddest guy on the camp, I know he can get the rest of the camp. You got to look for the one who is the leader, and they're not afraid to lead. You got to look for the one that stands on the yard all by himself, opens up his Bible, speaks to his God, and he don't need anybody else in a circle around him. That's the man you want to look to to follow. We don't look for men who are doing things to be attractive. We look for men who are attractive because of the things that they do. I've flown around the world with Jennifer Lopez. None of you guys really care about that. But I want to share with you guys how God took my life from the floor of a prison looking at 38 years and I was guilty to flying around the world to cities and the most beautiful countries in the world. And I'm going to let you know it wasn't because of anything that I had done. It was because one day at the bottom of my life, I made a decision I want to change. The crazy thing for me is the reason I wanted to change was because I had a little boy at home who I had made some promises to. The promise I made to my son was, son, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to be here for you. You're going to know your daddy's voice. I'm going to take you to your practices, and I'm going to drop you off at school and I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to give to you, son, all the things that I wish my daddy would have given to me. The problem was I was running into Harlem, New York, off of 171st in Amsterdam. Nobody looked like me. Nobody spoke my language. And I would walk into a high rise where four men would meet me with Uzis and shotguns. They'd shake me down on an elevator, take me to the top floor. And once I got to the top floor, I'd walk into a back room. I'd drop down a knapsack full of cash, and I'd pick up a knapsack full of bricks. I would take those bricks and chop them up. I'd saran wrap them around my legs and around the torso of my waist. I'd then cover it up with a double-breasted suit, an Italian silk tie, some Italian loafers. And I'd grab a briefcase, and I'd walk with cocaine strapped on my body through the airports of New York City, fly to Atlanta, Georgia, and I would drop off cocaine all the way back up the coast while I was telling my son, Daddy's always going to be here for you, boy. The problem was I got arrested three times in two states within three months, and I was guilty of everything that I had done. And it was then that I called home at 1 o'clock in the morning you know who we call home to, men. We call mama. And I called home to mama and I said, Mom, they got me again. And I'm going to prison for a long, long time. But mom, I don't want you to worry about me. Any of you guys tell mama that? I don't want you to worry about me. But you know, in the back of your head, you're saying, Mom, can you get me a lawyer? Can you bail me out as soon as you can, mama? When I hung up the phone with mama, 
I didn't know it then, but she told me later. At 1 a.m. in her home, she looked up into the sky. She said eight words that began a change in my life. She said, God, please help my boy. No, matter of fact, she said, God, if you exist, please help my boy. She didn't know who she was praying to even existed. But she was crying out because she didn't want her boy to do 38 years in prison. The truth of the matter is this. Men have traveled from all over the country to be here today because your mama has been praying for you. Amen. How many of you guys have a praying mama? And if it's not your mama, it's your grandmama. It's your daddy or it's your pawpaw. I don't care what you call them. Somebody's praying. God, please be merciful to my boy. So here's what I want to say to you. I knew I was going to prison. My mother had prayed for me. You would have thought that some angels would have floated into my prison cell playing some harps and some harmonicas. But God doesn't answer prayer the way we think he's going to answer it. God rarely ever answers prayer the way we think he's going to answer it. Instead, when the doors cracked in the morning, a man was st standing in my door waiting for me to come out. I chose not to go to breakfast because I didn't want any confrontation because I was still in the mode of thinking, how am I going to get myself out of 38 years in prison? How many of you guys have been there? But I went out for lunch because I was hungry. And when I went out for lunch, I grabbed my food tray. That same guy came up from behind me and clocked me behind. I turned around and took my food tray, tried to snap his head off into the wall of the prison. The guards came in. They separated us. They sent him to isolation. Then they looked at me and said, hey, Veneta, you want to go to church? I said, man, I don't want to go to no bleeping church. And I turned to walk away. And all of a sudden, I turned back around, and I walked into church, which was a six-by-nine prison cell. One other inmate was in there who didn't look like me. He was 15 years older than me. He was a black man. I was a young white man. And I sat there trying to figure out how am I going to get me out of this. And all of a sudden, a little short, big-bellied fellow with no hair on his head, somebody I never would have talked to on the streets, turned the corner and reached through the bars and gave me a small brown book called a Gideon Bible. How many of you guys got a Gideon sword? on you today he gave it to me to read i opened it up and i was faking the funk i acted like i was reading it but how many of you guys know i wasn't reading a thing <laughs> then he would say eight words that would change my life forever he said you look burdened can i pray for you men of faith men of god the greatest weapon god has given us is the ability to pray Amen. for someone else. And I came here after speaking to a man last night that some of you guys may know. How many of you guys know C.F. Hazelwood? Hey, yeah. hey. C.F. Hazelwood told me to come in here and make a charge to you men. He said, you men know our king. He said, you men bow down to our king. He said, you men are ready, and the faith in this unit is full. But I lay a charge to you. Who have you prayed with lately? Who have you stopped to tell your story to lately? The reality is everybody out here listening to me right now has a story. Am I right by show of hands? Everybody out here should have their hand up. Everybody out here has a story. Two things make our story great, men. The first thing is we have to share our story with someone else so that we can help them understand their story. If you never share your story, why would your sons and daughters do it any differently than their daddy did it? But if we can sit down and we can impact other men, not only do we impact them, but we impact their entire family because we tell them our story and we warn them not to make our mistakes and we incorporate how prayer has changed our lives. But who? Who cares if you say you pray for somebody if nobody ever sees you pray for somebody? Something about us as men, a big part of the challenge that we have 
is to be able to go out and be spiritual and not be religious. And one of the biggest challenges is when I flew around the world with Jennifer Lopez. How many guys know who J-Lo is? The little fly cutie. I flew around the world on private jet planes, and when we would land, we would land in cities and states and countries I had never been to, couldn't even pronounce the name of. I'd been to Santander, Spain, Alicante, Benidorm, Barcelona, Madrid. I went off the coast of Morocco to the Canary Islands. I went to South America to Caracas and Maracaibo, Venezuela, Panama City, Panama, San Salvador, El Salvador. And I would always say one thing. I would say life does not get any better than this. It was a good life. How many guys would trade what we're doing today to fly around the world on a private jet? Three of you. <laughs> the reason that that is significant, I don't share that to impress you. I share that with you because there was a day that I was on the floor of a prison looking at 38 years and I was guilty. And on that day when that man prayed with me, I didn't know what was going on in my life or in my world. I didn't know what God was going to do or not going to do for me. But on that day, pretty much like a football team. Any of you guys football fans out here? A couple of you? Listen, on that day, I made God the GM of my franchise. I made Jesus Christ the head coach of my life, the head coach of my team. And I asked the Holy Spirit to quarterback every decision that I make. You just hand the ball off to me or you pass it to me, Holy Ghost, and I'm going to run with it and we're going to score. Keith Davis was here earlier today. I'm sure he told you that there's a first half, there's a halftime, and there's a second half in your life. Did he share that with you? This is the halftime of our lives. Don't allow your time to do you. You do your time. Don't waste your day with checkers and cards. But wake up and have a plan. Ask God for concepts and wisdom, ideas and strategies. Prepare me, God, to be an entrepreneur in here. So when I get out there, I don't have to beg a man to raise a shovel and scoot some dirt across the corner. Inside of us are all kinds of different operations that we did on the street. Why can't we turn that and legalize that and use that for the kingdom of God so we can build businesses so when other men get out of prison, yeah. we can go to them and say, I have a job for you already. Yeah. Instead, we watch television all day long. We scoot checkers across the board. We play chess for all hours of the day. Then we watch garbage television all day long, filling our minds with nothing but junk. And then we show up at church for an hour and we say, oh, thank you, Jesus. If you don't spend time with him, how are you ever going to really fully tap into what he's created you to do? I tell men all the time, do you know the voice of God in your life? Have you heard him speak to you lately? And most men say, I have not heard him speak to me lately. Then I tell them to take their headset off. Because you've been listening to Lil Wayne and Boozy. Because you've been listening to your favorite country musician, your favorite rock star, your favorite rapper. You know the lines to every one of their songs. You can sing the entire album. You know their lyrics. Yet God has given us 66 albums. He's given us an old book and a new book full of albums. And when we find ourselves in trouble, we can quote Lil Wayne. But we can't quote the God who created us. We have got to internalize the word. Shut off the noise that is in our lives, brother. Become the man that God can use in here. That when he speaks, you hear him in the midst of a loud room. Because he speaks in a whisper to those he calls his sons. It doesn't matter that there's noise all around you. When he speaks to you, it's undescribable. And all we have to do is obey. I remember when I was in New York City, I lived in Lower East Side. And I remember I was walking up the block in New York. And in New York, the streets aren't very clean. There's paper and there's trash. There's cigarettes. There's cigarette butts. There's cans all over the streets. And as I was walking up the block, I remember God saying to me, 
stop and pick up that piece of paper. I said, Lord, you're bugging, right? You ever talk like that to God? Man, Lord, you're bugging. He didn't ask me to pick up all the paper. He asked me to pick and stop and pick up one piece of paper. Let me tell you why this triggered a bad thing for me. When I was a little boy growing up, I never met my real father. And I grew up with a stepfather. Matter of fact, because I've never met him, I don't know what he looks like and I don't know his voice. If my real dad is here today, just slip your hand in the air so I can identify you. We need to talk about some back child support, dog. Where you at up in here? Up in here. He's not here. Yeah, I typically get a big black dude telling me, yeah, I'm your daddy, dog. Yeah, I'm your daddy. And then I'm like, how much money you got on your books, dog? If you don't got full books, you ain't my daddy. Men, my stepfather would tell me to mow the lawn at my house. And I would go out there and I hated mowing it, but I'd put my music on and I'd go out there and I'd do it just because it was a task that had to be done. I wouldn't do it with the right attitude. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I would do it with a bad attitude. But I would mow that lawn. And I would go around and I would make it look good and I would get done. And when I got done, I would sit back. Now I knew I only did a half-ass job. But I would wait for my stepdad to come home so he could see I mowed the lawn. And when he would come home, the first thing he would do is walk around the lawn and point out everything that I did wrong. Everything. And he would say, look at this piece of paper. Pick that piece of paper up. Look at that gum wrapper. Pick that gum wrapper up. As much as I wanted him to just tell me I had done a good job, because that's what fathers must do to affirm their children. I didn't want to do anything for that man because every time I did something, he only picked out what I had done wrong. So now as I'm walking up through the street in Manhattan and I hear God tell me to stop and pick up that piece of paper, because we base our relationship with him off of our relationship with our natural fathers, my first inclination was to tell him, I ain't picking up that piece of paper. And I continued to walk. And I heard him say it again, stop, pick up that piece of paper. I went past him to the other end of the block. He said, stop, pick up that piece of paper. I got to the end of the block and finally I heard him in a whisper. He said to me softly, go back and pick up that piece of paper. And so I did what some of you guys would have done. I marched back real angry. Wouldn't you guys have done the same thing? <laughs> And I bent over in front of the crowd of people in New York City. And I picked up that one piece of paper and I said, there, God, are you happy? I went back and I picked up the piece of paper and I threw it into the trash can. And then God spoke to me again. He said, son, if I can't trust you to stop and pick up a piece of paper that the world has thrown away, how can I ever trust you? to stop and help one of my sons or daughters who have been discarded by this world. Amen. It's about hearing the voice of our father and obeying what he is telling us to do. He doesn't care that you have 64 of the books of the Bible memorized. What he cares about is are you living those books? What he cares about is do you have my love inside of you? Or are you pointing at other people 